Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, I hope you're all well. I hope you had a good night's rest uh, and that you are ready for more students because that's what we're going to be doing next. Uh, so, um, uh, now we are going to uh, continue on the Sutta, the Majjhimanikaya number 117, the Mahakatalisaka Sutta. And so far we have looked at uh, right view, and right view being the very first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and this Sutta, it shows very beautifully how right view is like the uh, condition for everything else, and how uh, right view gives rise to all of the other factors of the path. So it uh, emphasizes the idea of right view a lot. And uh, I think this is uh, very interesting because it sh just shows us how uh, important it is to reflect about the Dhamma in the right way, to uh, get the right information from the suttas, and how to think about the world in the appropriate way. And uh, this is what we find also in the second factor here, the importance of right view. And uh, here we are now coming to the idea of Samma Sankapa, sometimes called intention. Um, it is an interesting word, uh, Sankapa, what exactly does it mean? And you will find that in the suttas it is sometimes translated as thought, yeah, right thought, uh, sometimes as right intention. And, and uh, sometimes you hear people like me saying it means like right purpose or right aim having the right aim in life, having the right purpose. Uh, and uh, sometimes even Ajahn Brahm translates it as right motivation sometimes. So, and uh, all of these things are really just, in a sense, different angles on the same idea. You know, the, uh, when we think about things, we also intend. Thinking and intention are very closely related to each other. You cannot really think without having an intention. Intention means where you are going. Going, yeah, we're heading towards in the future now. And uh, you cannot, uh, intention can be a bit more subtle than thinking. So it's possible to have intention without thought, but it's not really possible to have thought without intention. So these are just different angles on the same word. Uh, so they, it all has, in a sense, that kind of general idea. Uh, and the intention is very closely related to the idea of purpose and aim and goal, where we are headed. You know, if you have an intention, it means you intend to go in a certain direction. And so this has to do with the purpose of our life and the aim of our life. This is what this particular factor is about. Uh, so this is very interesting, right? When we're talking about the aim of our life, whether our aim is more like a, a spiritual existence or whether our aim or purpose or goal is more of a worldly existence, yeah, with a career and with a family life or whatever. Uh, or maybe it is a big bit of a mixture. And many of you, it probably will be a bit of a mixture. Uh, on the one hand, you have the uh, worldly existence. On the other hand, you want to imbue that with something more profound, like a spiritual uh, life at, at the same time. Uh, so you can see here how this right intention is what gives direction to our life. Uh, you know, if you intend in a certain way, that intention uh, that comes from the uh, values that we have, and you can see here how it, it, it is directed by right view. Yeah, if you have a view in a certain way, that view gives you a certain values, uh, things that are important to you, those values, uh, and give you a sense of purpose and direction. And that purpose and direction is what we mean by intention here. So from you come your values, what is important to you, what you prioritize, and those priorities then become your intention, your goal for the future. It's a very strong connection between right view and right intention. These things are directly connected to each other. And um, uh, right intention, uh, I know Ajahn Brahm likes to call it uh, motivation as well. Uh, and when you have a, a intention, you want that intention is always driven by something. And that thing which drives the intention, drives the goal, is what motivates you. Uh, yeah? So if you are motivated by uh, being kind, you want to be kind in the world, you want to do the right thing, you want to uh, give up some of the worldly cravings because you want to become more spiritual, uh, well, you are motivated by that kindness, you're motivated by those things, and that drives you towards a certain goal. So all of these things are very closely related to each other. 
So let's see what the uh, Buddha has to say about this. So, and he says, uh, uh, therein, in other words, in regard to right attention, because right view comes first. Uh, and how does right view come first? Uh, you understand wrong intention as wrong intention and right intention as right intention. Uh, this is your right view. So you have a, a clarity about what is right and wrong intention. Uh, yeah, this is what view, right view is about. Uh, and it's fairly obvious why that is the case. Yeah, right view means what does it mean? Well, it means uh, ultimately it means understanding where there is happiness and where there is suffering in the world. Uh, yeah, where you're going to find real contentment and real satisfaction. Uh, yeah, if you think about the first noble truth, it's all about dukkha. So it's, if you understand dukkha, if you understand suffering, uh, it means that you also understand happiness. Uh, and if you understand happiness and suffering, well, then your mind will always incline. Uh, it always directs itself uh, towards happiness. Nobody wants to suffer. Yeah, that's as obvious. As long as we have feelings, uh, we don't want to suffer. So if you understand the world in the right way, uh, you understand where happiness is to be found, uh, where satisfaction is to be found, uh, and where suffering is to be found, uh, then automatically your mind will intend uh, in a different direction. It will tend towards the happiness. Uh, but you have to understand, yeah, and this is why right view is so important. Yeah? So uh, to give you an example, yeah, if you uh, think about, for example, morality, yeah, if you really understand that morality is going to make you happy rather than make you suffer, uh, then you start to intend more in terms of being moral. You want to be more kind. Uh, you want to avoid the ill will, the negative aspects of the mind. Uh, your mind is directed towards morality. Uh, and it happens automatically. It happens as an automatic result of right view. Uh, you just really have to reflect on that morality. You have to reflect on uh, why it is important. I mentioned this yesterday. And the more you get that, the more you understand this. So that right view drives the right intention uh, and you become a better person as a consequence. So, so it is very, again, it shows you the significance of reflection on the Buddhist path. Uh, understanding, uh, you know, seeing things in accordance with the Buddha in this way. Uh, in other words, leaning towards right view. And that right view then kind of carrying on into right intention. Uh, so um, the more, in a more profound way, you can understand the importance of being moral, being kind, uh, having right seal, uh, having all the right conduct, and all of these kind of things. Uh, the, the deeper you can understand that, uh, the more powerful your path is going to be, because all of these factors are, are going to come into existence as a, as a result of that. Uh, yeah? And as I mentioned yesterday as well, the idea of uh, if you have a understanding of the limits of the ordinary world, yeah, the ordinary world around us, you see some of the limitations, some of the suffering and the problems in that world, uh, then your mind is going to change the intention again. The intention is going to go more towards the spiritual life, uh, more towards the peace within, uh, the satisfaction within, because you understand that that is where you find true happiness and contentment in this world. Uh, so again, you can see the connection between view and intention. It's almost as if, if your view is right, uh, everything else falls into place, yeah? So it, focusing on right view is one of those very significant issues on the Buddhist path. The more that uh, is, is correct, uh, the more everything falls into place. Uh, part of that is that you understand right intention as right intention, wrong intention as wrong intention. And because you understand that, it's almost as if the mind automatically goes to right intention. You don't have to worry, you don't have to think too much about it. Uh, if the view is right, intention just falls into place. So, um, and uh, then the Buddha said, what bhikkhus is wrong intention? Uh, the intention of sensual desire, the intention of ill will, uh, and the intention of cruelty. This is the wrong intention. Uh, so what does this mean? And um, what this means is that the first one, intention of sensual desire, really just means that you are interested in the world of the five senses. Yeah, you have interest in that world. You want to control that world. You want to uh, do things in that world. So almost all our intentions are related to that world. Yeah, 
if you think about it, uh, because we are so immersed in that world. Uh, so whenever you are driven towards something in your life, whenever you work hard, for something in that world, uh, whenever you, whatever you do, all of that really falls under the intention of sensual desire. Uh, we can see the translation is not very good because when we talk about sensual desire in English, uh, it is often quite limited. We are talking about a very broad category of things. Uh, yeah, everything in that world of the five senses is actually included in that. Uh, so, yeah, and that's what I was saying uh, the other, uh, yesterday about. Uh, you know, how we are immersed in this world of the five senses, uh, how almost everything we do is part of that world. Uh, so because of that, almost all our intention to relate to that world. Uh, yeah, we always kind of, whenever you uh, go to work or you're dealing with your family or you're dealing with entertainment or, or whatever it is, all of these things are really related to that world. Uh, and uh, what we are trying to do is find the opposite in, in, intention. We will see that in a second which is the uh, intention of renunciation, yeah? Which is giving up that entire world, really, yeah? Gradually withdrawing from that world uh, because you see the problem and moving towards the profound inner world instead of peace and quiet and insight and all of that. Uh. So for this reason, it's a very profound thing, yeah? I, I don't think people often fully understand the context and, and the, the full meaning of these things. Uh, Intention of sensual desire is a very broad category and a very uh, all-encompassing intention. Uh, and uh, for that reason, it's actually very, uh, very important to understand what is going on here. Uh, then you have the intention of uh, ill will. That is much more easy to understand. Uh, it is whenever you are uh, driven, you can say the motivation of ill will, if you like. If you're motivated by ill will in your own, and this obviously means uh, the anger, yeah, or being upset with someone, uh, uh, even having just irritation towards somebody. Uh, all of that is part of the motivation of ill will. It's fairly obvious what it means, uh, yeah. And uh, obviously, it comes from wrong view, which is fascinating. Every time you have ill will, it is based on wrong view. Uh, kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, every time you have an intention of sensual sensuality, moving towards the sensory objects of the world. Uh, that too is comes from wrong view now, because you don't really understand what leads to satisfaction and happiness. So the last one is the call here, the intention of cruelty. Uh, what this uh, really refers to, the, uh, the word that is here translated as cruelty is a vihingsa. And vihingsa really means something like uh, being harmful, yeah, being something that is uh, harming and, and problematic. Uh, uh, whereby you don't care for the effects of your actions on other people. Uh, yeah? if, for example, if you are you know, out walking on a walking path somewhere, and you can see this here at Polinyal Monastery, we see it all the time because there are so many insects on the ground. Yeah? We have the ants walking and they walk in kind of long uh, columns yeah, along the ground, uh, and they will be everywhere, and you have other insects uh, and whatever. And if you don't care about the insects, if you just walk everywhere, and you don't care if you step on them, uh, that is a case of vihingsa vitaka, where you don't care about the consequences of your actions. Uh, so it's a kind of cold heartedness, yeah, a, a kind of inconsiderateness, uh, a kind of carelessness, ruthlessness about the world around you. This is what this intention really means. Uh, it's not just that you, cruelty to me is a little bit uh, too narrow because cruelty means that you actually enjoy um, harming other people or other beings and not, it's not that common to enjoy harming others uh, but it's more like this carelessness uh, not taking into account the fact that you're harming others uh, yeah and it's fascinating that this is a wrong intention yeah because you might think that well, what's the big deal you don't have any ill will it's just kind of an accident you're walking there but the point is that you are prioritizing your own happiness. Yeah? You're prioritizing your own desires. You say, I want to walk here. I don't care what it does to these other beings. And if I trample down all these insects, it's not my fault that they are, they are walking in the wrong place. I don't care what happens to these ants. Yeah? And they shouldn't be walking here. This is my path. Go away, ants. This is, this is what I, I want to be doing here. And if you think like that, then you are being inconsiderate. Yeah, you don't care about other beings. 
And this is problematic because you're driven by your own self-interest. Me, me, me. Everything is about me. And I don't really care about the effects on other people. So that is, uh, is what this is about. Uh, so now we come to this uh, idea again of uh, the factors being twofold. Yeah, and the Buddha says, uh, and what bhikkhus uh, is right intention? Right intention, I say, is twofold. There is a right attention that is affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisition, and there is a right intention that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. So uh, uh, again, I, I don't think we should make too much of this distinction. The distinction is very, is not all that great. Uh, yeah, because the Buddha really only talks about one kind of right intention. Uh, and it's always the same. It's the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of non-cruelty. It's the same, whether you are a stream mentor in area or you are an ordinary person, right intention is actually the same thing. Uh, the distinction here really is only between it's it's made for the for the sake of pointing out that if you are not a normal person, if you are an ordinary person in Putujana, you haven't yet perfected right intention. Yeah, there is more to be done. It is you're trying, you're still um, doing your very best to have right intention, but it's not yet a natural part of you. That's really all it is saying. Yeah. Once you become an area, then this right intention is almost automatic. Yeah. So uh, don't worry too much about that distinction because to my mind, it is not all that uh, meaningful. Though. Anyway, what bhikkhus is, is that intention which is uh, affected by the tanks, etc. And it is the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of non-cruelty. This is right intention that is affected by the tanks. And... Uh, uh, again, so this is not only is it affected by the tanks, but this is also the right intention of the noble ones, uh, except that for the noble ones, it is more settled. That's really the only distinction here. Yeah. So what is the intention of renunciation? And uh, to understand this, what this means yeah, is when you are meditating and you are really happy and you are going inwards and you're feeling you you don't not interest in the world anymore you don't want to have anything to do with your job or your entertainments or your even your family you want to give them up right for a short time yeah not forever but at least for a short time and leave them all behind it because you are so happy inside you find the joy you find the peace you find the all these beautiful qualities within that you want to give up that world outside there. not interested in seeing things not interested in hearing things in touching things and uh, being part of that world uh, because you have realized at this point uh, that that world is problematic uh, and the deeper you go in your meditation the more satisfaction you find within uh, the more you understand how problematic the world outside is uh, because you understand uh, that the world outside actually blocks you from enjoying the peace the beauty the happiness uh, the delight that you find within yourself uh, yeah? so this is what it means the intention of renunciation the intention to not have any interest in that world but to go within and go inside instead into a degree of happiness uh, so it is very profound, this idea of renunciation. It's like the giving up of the external world. Uh, that is what it really is about. Uh, and that is the main meaning of this, because the power word here is nekama. And nekama is literally the opposite of karma. Karma is the uh, uh, essential desire, yeah, or the essential world, the five sense organs. Uh, and nekama is the opposite of that, so the giving up of the five senses, moving away uh, from the sense organs and the, and the <coughs> interest in that world. <coughs> so uh, nekama can also be even deeper than that. It's possible to renounce in an even deeper way, but this is the most important part of it, because if you can do that, okay, it means that you can enter samadhi, and if you can enter samadhi, it will take you all the way to the end of the Buddhist path, uh, just through that samadhi practice. So, 
Then you have the intention of uh, non-ill will, yeah, and this is basically the metta intention, seeing the good qualities in other beings, wishing other beings well, uh, having this sense of beautiful feeling inside that all people in the world, all beings in the world, they deserve happiness, seeing the good in others. Uh, remember that there is a lot of goodness in the world, and sometimes when you read the news or you, you look at things around you, it may seem like there are so many bad things in the world, but there's also a lot of goodness in the world. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the all your Buddhist companions, the people who keep the five precepts, the eight precepts, who go on meditation retreat, who try to read the suttas, and, and uh, there is so much good intention there. People who want to do the right thing, uh, people who are not perhaps perfect, uh, not able to do things all the way, the way they would like uh, to do things, uh, still they have the right intention. And what a marvelous thing it is to be with people who at least have the right intention. So please rejoice in that. Uh, please try not to be too fault-finding fault with the people around you. Because if you are fault-finding, uh, all that's going to happen is that you're going to be more miserable yourself. Yeah, you're dragging yourself down. You're being your own enemy if you're too fault-finding with others. Uh, also, if you are too fault-finding with yourself. Remember, if you're fault-finding with others, uh, you're also going to be fault-finding with yourself as well. We cannot really separate those things. Yeah, they go together. So it is going to be very problematic for you. So keep up that fault-finding mind if you can. Uh, then there is the intention here of non-cruelty or of non-harming, uh, if you like, the intention of uh, being considerate towards others. And this is very similar to the idea of compassion. Yeah? If you are compassionate, you don't want to hurt others. Uh, you care for how your actions affect the people around you, the animals around you, and everything around you. You care about that. Uh, that is what compassion of this world. Uh, uh, our actions have effects, uh, and we are uh, we remember the effects of our actions. Uh, so this, all of this, is about your intention. Yeah, it is about where you are heading. Yeah? It's about your purpose in life. Your purpose becomes these things: uh, movement towards giving things up that are inherently unsatisfactory, uh, a movement towards. Uh, appreciation and compassion for the people around you and the world around you. And that movement here is what right intention is about. It's a new goal. It's a new purpose in life, a new aim, a new, um, a new way of looking at things. So, so uh, yeah, and all of this ar arises from right view. This is what, what we have been seeing here before. And this is why the Buddha says what he's saying here. You make an effort to abandon the wrong intention and to enter upon right intention. That is your right effort. Mindfully, you abandon wrong intention. Mindfully, you enter upon a vibe in right intention. It is your right mindfulness. Thus, these three qualities, they run and circle around right intention. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. So um, uh, please stay there, uh, Bobby, for a while. Yeah. So um, the um, uh, idea here is that uh, you know you need the right view because the right view gives rise to the right intention. It points you in the right way. It drives you in the right uh, uh, right direction. Yeah. Uh, if you have the right view, if you understand the danger, the ill will, etc., how it is dangerous, especially for you. It is really how it is dangerous for you. That is the most important thing. Yeah. If you get that, uh, then of course you are going to be more kind. Uh, yeah, you're going to be. But you have to get it in a very profound sense. Uh, and this is why the strengthening of view on the Buddhist path is so important. Uh, so you strengthen that uh, through right view. It's a right view is what allows right intention to arise. Uh, it again shows the importance of right view on this. Uh, and then you have this awareness in your mind. Yeah? You know that sometimes you forget what is right. Yeah? In the daily life, sometimes it's very, very easy to forget your intentions to uh, distinguish between right and wrong. Yeah? So you have to make an effort to, to guide the mind back to right intention again. Uh, yeah? This is such a fundamental part of this practice. The so right effort always has to be there with this, uh, guiding your mind again and again and again. Uh, Right view is uh, there at the back of your mind. Yeah, the right view always telling you uh, 
hopefully always telling you what is going on. The right mindfulness is there to then establish whether you are following the right view or not. This is kind of the idea of right mindfulness. And then when right mindfulness tells you that you're not following the right view, that the right effort comes in and redirects your uh, intention to then uh, move in the right direction. So these four things, yeah, running around each other and then giving you that uh, uh, movement, that ability to uh, head in the right direction. Yeah. So then right intention is established. And once you have right intention, of course, then uh, the other factors of the path follow as a consequence of that right intention. So I'm now going to very br briefly have a look at the other factors of the path, the morality factors. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, I really enjoy these morality factors because they are, to my mind, they are very beautiful, the way they are talked about by the Buddha. Um, so I'm just adding these in here because they're not actually part of the uh, Sabhasava Sutta. Sabhasava Sutta Majjhima Nikaya number two is the main background for this particular Sutta retreat is what I want to focus on, but because the factors of morality are not included in that sutta, I want to just touch on them very briefly before we come back to that sutta again. Yeah, but uh, it's amazing, be so beautiful the way the Buddha talks about these factors of morality. So for that reason, uh, I, I always just bring it up, if only very briefly. Yeah. So let's have a look at the idea of right speech. Yeah. Their in because right view comes first. And how does right view come first? You understand wrong speech as wrong speech and right speech as right. This is one's right view. Yeah, yeah. so you have right view means understanding what is wrong speech and what is right speech. And you may Perhaps you think it's obvious that what is right speech and what is wrong speech. You don't really need that much right view. A little bit of right view is enough. But uh, uh, what the Buddha is saying here is that to fully appreciate what is right speech and what is wrong speech, uh, you actually really you need to be a stream mentor before you can fully appreciate that. Uh, if you're not a stream mentor, you can appreciate it only partially at best. Uh, yeah, this is kind of this is the idea behind this. So it means that we can always improve our speech and we can always make our speech better. We can always move towards an even better speech. How? By purifying our view. Yeah, the more right view you have, the more ability you will have to understand what is right speech. So, and um, uh, so again, it shows you the importance of right view. And it also shows you, I just, I want to and I'll point this out one more time. It also, right view also uh, makes it, uh, it um, uh, makes the urgency of my speech more obvious. Yeah, you kind of understand the significance of these things, why it matters so enormously. So it shows you what it is, uh, and it also shows you the urgency of these things, why these things really matter, how ideally we should make every part of our speech right. Uh, Every time we open our mouth, yeah, it makes a difference. And one very simple way of thinking about right speech, sometimes it can be very hard yeah, getting speech right all the time because uh, we speak a lot. Uh, one way of thinking about it is to think about it as a gift. Yeah, Every time you open your mouth, you have the potential to give a gift to other people. And what a beautiful thing that is to be able to give a gift to somebody. Yeah? And if somebody feels well in your presence, they feel that they have spoke, you have spoken to them and it goes to your heart and you feel really good about yourself as a consequence, then you have given a gift to that person. And every time we open our mouth, we have that potential. So see if you can make your speech into a gift to the people around you. But it is very important in these kind of contexts to also remember that if you are going to give a gift to somebody, if you are going to be able to have the right speech at all times, sometimes I think people find it difficult. And for that reason, they will often force themselves to have the right speech. Yeah? It's hard to speak right all the time. So you kind of have to, uh, you know, you have to kind of almost 
use willpower to be able to uh, say the right thing. Uh, but uh, that is not, not the ideal way of doing it. The ideal way of doing it is to understand other people, uh, to understand the happiness that you can give others, uh, the freedom from suffering you can give other people. Uh, and the more you understand that, uh, the more ability you will have in actually uh, speaking right every single time, because you really want to give a gift to other people. You want to support them because you understand that, that other people have a difficult life, just like everyone has. And we have far too much dukkha and suffering in this world. Uh, and if you can give a gift to that suffering, suffering world, uh, what a marvelous thing that becomes as a consequence. Uh, so allow these kind of things to come from deep within, coming from real care, real compassion, real understanding, not having to force yourself always to say the right thing, yeah? but actually trying to change your attitude instead. Yeah? And then the right speech comes out uh, in a far more natural, unforced and beautiful uh, way as a consequence. Yeah? So uh, what is it? wrong speech it is false speech yeah lying in other words malicious speech in other words when you uh, say things that are uh, here actually it means really divisive speech i think is a better term you are dividing people apart from each other uh, uh, harsh speech this is when you speak in a way that people find unpleasant it is kind of a, you know to maybe have a bit of anger in it that sort of thing yeah and the last one is a gossip or it is idle chatter. You know, these are the four kinds of wrong speech usually talked about uh, in the sutras. But uh, I, let's focus on the right speech instead. And what because is right speech. And then again, you have this twofold distinction. Yeah? On the one hand, the ordinary right speech of ordinary people. Uh, and on the other hand, you have the right speech of the noble ones. And again, it is basically the same thing. There isn't really any difference between the two. It's just that the noble ones have purified this to a higher degree. So what is the right, the ordinary right speech? Is this the abstinence from lying? The abstinence from divisive speech? The abstinence from harsh speech? The abstinence from idle chatter or gossip? That is the ordinary right speech. So um, um, let us um, have a look at that. Yeah, what is this actually? I, I, this is just so nice. I, I haven't actually included this in the uh, notes that you have there, but uh, this is just the standard passages in the suttas uh, find found, found on right speech. Yeah, so I'm just going to read this out to you because uh, it is so uh, uh, so nice. Uh, uh, so then you have the. Uh, idea of not lying, yeah, which is the first part there, abstinence from false speech. And this is the way it is described in the suttas, yeah, uh, that you give up lying. Yeah? You speak the truth and you stick to the truth. Yeah? You are honest and trustworthy. Yeah? You don't trick the world with your words. Yeah? Yeah, and there is, you can see that there is much more there than not lying, yeah? Not lying is only one aspect of that, uh, but actually it is you speak the truth and you stick to the truth. Uh, in other words, the idea is that uh, not only do you avoid lying, but you actually are deliberately talking the truth, uh, yeah? You're not uh, trying to kind of find what is the exact boundary between lying and truth, but, but you try to be as truthful as possible. Uh, yeah, this is what it's saying here. You're honest and trustworthy. People feel they can trust you. But if you are just bordering on truthfulness, if you're trying to get away with things uh, without breaking your precepts or whatever, uh, then you don't become all that trustworthy. Uh, but you are as, pos as reliable as you possibly can. Uh, you don't trick the world with your words. Yeah, this is a visandada ko loko. And visandada means like you are deceiving the world in a sense. But instead of deceiving the world, you are as straightforward as you possibly can with your words. So this is the ideal here. The ideal is much more than not lying. It's about being direct and immediate, as trustworthy as you possibly can. That is the ideal of right speech. 
So it's a very high bar to clear, yeah? And many people find, find it difficult to clear this, uh, but it gives you an idea of what we are moving towards. It gives an idea when you feel really at ease with yourself. You don't have to kind of uh, pretend anymore because if you lie, then you often kind of entangle yourself in very difficult situations. Uh, but even if you don't tell the full truth, you might entangle yourself in difficult situations. The more direct you are, the more close you are to reality, uh, the more at ease you can be because uh, there's nothing there to defend. You don't have to defend something which is partially true or partially dodgy. You can, be, you can just be yourself uh, and it's very, it makes life very simple. Uh. So that is the ordinary way that um, uh, uh, to speak, abandoning lying is uh, talked about. And then we have the abandoning of divisive speech. Yeah, you give up divisive speech. Uh, you don't repeat in one place what you have heard in another, so as to divide people against each other. Instead, you reconcile those who are divided. Uh, supporting unity, delighting in harmony, loving harmony, speaking words that promote harmony. Yeah, it is one of those beautiful aspects, again, the idea of always moving towards harmony yeah, and being someone who is delighting in harmony, bringing people together. Yeah, the world is often so divisive already as it actually is. Yeah. But here you are doing the exact opposite. You are rejoicing in the harmony of the world instead. And what a wonderful thing that is. We need people like that in the world, yeah, because of the divisiveness around us. I'm going through this fairly quickly because uh, uh, yeah, this is kind of secondary to the main sutta. But uh, I, I just love these little things so much. I want to read them out. Every time I do a retreat, I want to read these things out because they are so... I don't know, they really go to the heart, I feel. Then you have the uh, idea of giving up harsh speech. Yeah, you give up harsh speech. Uh, you speak in a way that's mellow, uh, pleasing to the ear, uh, lovely, that uh, goes to the heart, uh, that is polite and likable and agreeable to people. Uh, yeah, the, uh, all of this is very, uh, again, even in the Pali, it is very beautiful. Uh, and the idea of it is, uh, you know, it, it goes to the heart, yeah, when you speak. So people feel really at ease, yeah. If you speak to somebody, it goes to people's heart. Uh, you have really touched them with your speech. Uh, you feel, wow, yeah, this is so nice to listen to this person uh, because it goes directly to the heart. It makes me feel so happy to hear this person speak. And it kind of lifts up the people around you when you hear people speak in that way. Uh, and again, this is the idea of giving a gift to the people around you when you speak in this way. Yeah? You're gifting them with speech that goes to the heart, that lifts them up, that makes them feel at ease, that rejoice in harmony. All of these things coming together in one go. And then we have the last aspect of right speech, yeah? the idea of giving up the idle chatter. Instead of talking too much, you have words that are timely. Yeah, true. They are meaningful. Yeah, they, are, they actually have a purpose to them. They are, have to do with the, the Dhamma, perhaps. They are in line with the Dhamma and the training. Yeah. And you say things that are at the right time that are valuable, reasonable, succinct, and beneficial. Yeah. yeah, your words are like a treasure. And when people hear your words, when people hear the word of the Buddha, it's like, wow, there's a treasure here. There's a diamond, there is a jewel, it's a ratana, that's why we have the triple gem. And you take these teachings to heart. Yeah? So sometimes when you hear the sutta as being spoken, and sometimes when you come across a sentence that really touches you in a deep way, something which really goes to the heart, remember that. Remember it deeply. And then on a rainy day, when you have some difficulty, then bring it out and read it again to yourself to uh, encourage yourself to. Uh, brighten up your mind and to take yourself forward. Uh, there are so many jewels in this Buddhist teachings, uh, and the more of these jewels that you have carry with you in your heart, uh, the more ability you have to encourage yourself and to uh, to um, uh, to support yourself in your own practice. So, so uh, that is just the uh, more detailed appreciation of right speech. Uh, 
and then coming back to Majin Malikai 117, and, and the Buddha rounds it off, as always, by saying that you make an effort to, to abandon the wrong speech and, and to enter upon right speech. This is your right effort. Mindfully, you abandon wrong speech, and mindfully, you enter upon and abide in right speech. This is your right mindfulness. And those three, these three states, they run and circle around right speech. That is right effort, right, sorry, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. So, um, Again, very the same idea as we had before. Yeah, you have you once you have the right view, and that view is kind of lodged in the back of your mind, you really understand the importance of speaking rightly. You understand how this makes such a massive difference for your own practice if you get your speech right. So the view is there. So make sure that view is strong. Yeah? Make sure you really understand this. Yeah, why does speech matter? Matter? Yeah? Why does it matter, especially for you, for your own life, for your own happiness, for your own well-being? Yeah? But also, if you like, for the well-being around you. Investigate that. Yeah? Reflect on that. Contemplate that. Understand these things deeply. Because when you understand these things deeply, that is what is meant by right view. Yeah? This is why this matters so, so, so much. So get these things. And once you get that, once that is lodged at the back of your mind, then your mindfulness will kick in. Yeah, because it is so important to you, that is what enables mindfulness to kick in, because you will remember what is important to you. And when you remember that, the mindfulness kicks in, that every time your speech is maybe bordering on going the wrong way, mindfulness will say, wait, I'm heading in the wrong direction here. How can I do these things differently? And then you use your effort to bring up your wisdom, bring up your understanding, guide your mind in a different direction, and then apply right speech instead. But don't apply it by force. Apply it because you understand compassion, you understand the idea of kindness and the importance of these things. And when you do that, the right speech comes almost naturally. You don't have to force yourself to be kind. If you find that your speech does not come naturally, then take a break. Yeah, go, don't talk, go somewhere else, put on a... Uh, you know, put on a mask or something like that. This is the nice thing about now being in the COVID situation. We can put on a mask at any time and nobody's going to say anything. And then you can kind of be quiet for a while because you know if I speak now, it's going to be problematic. Yeah. So these are some of the... Please, please don't move on yet, uh, Robbie. These are some of the uh, fundamental things uh, on the Buddhist... Path. Yeah, these are some of the, uh, the basic things, and to me, these are the things that are really worthy of uh, attention, because if you get these basic things on the path, uh, it means that you are going to go a long, long way also in a meditation practice. I think very often that one of the biggest mistakes that we do is that we don't fully appreciate the importance of the foundations on the path. Uh, get the foundations right, uh, and things then happen as a consequence uh, uh, from that. Uh, Let's take a five minute break, just do a little bit of meditation, just to collect the mind a little bit, and then we can move on to the next factor in five minutes' time. Okay.
Okay, everyone. So let's uh, come back to the sutta again. Yeah. So we are <coughs> uh, gradually going through the uh, the factors of the path. Uh, yeah, we are looking at the uh, morality factors just briefly before we come on to the uh, later factors. Uh, and I always think it's so useful to go through all these basic things. Uh, uh, so now we come to uh, right action. And uh, the Buddha is following here. Uh, they're in because, uh, yeah, in other words, in this case, right view comes first. Uh, and how does right view come first? Uh, one understands wrong action as wrong and right action as right. Uh, this is one's right view. Yeah, so the, again, this idea of fully understanding what is wrong action, uh, we can really only fully understand this through right view. And one of the big problems, I haven't really mentioned this so much yet, but one of the big problems is that uh, because of the sense of self, we always have a vested interest in our actions and how we live our lives. Uh, the sense of self always distorts things. Uh, it always distorts things uh, in the way that we tend to become egocentric. Yeah? We tend to think about ourselves and, how, and what we get out of things. Uh, and uh, right view, of course, is ultimately, it is about seeing through the delusion of the self. And when you see through the delusion of the self, only then does, you know, uh, is there no self-interest anymore because you understand that it was an illusion in the first place. And for that reason, only when you see through that delusion is it possible to have right action at all times and, and fully. Only then does it really become possible. Uh, so that is also an important part of this, yeah? in addition to the idea of understanding morality and understanding the limits of the world that I talked about before, in the more deep sense, it is also about the idea of uh, understanding non-self. Yeah? So right, we can see how right view here is so uh, fundamental to all of these things. So. so again, it is something worth contemplating, making strong, yeah, that right view, understanding why these things are important and why it matters to, uh, to not have wrong, uh, wrong action, etc. So what because it is the wrong action? Uh, it is killing living beings, taking what is not given, in other words, stealing uh, and sexual misconduct. Uh, this is wrong action. Uh, and uh, then we have the same paragraph again about the wrong action being twofold. Yeah? And remember, this really just refers to the right action of ordinary people compared to the right action of the noble ones. So it is the same, except that the noble ones have purified it more. That's the only difference. So, so what is right action? Well, the right action is the abstinence from killing living beings, so the abstinence from stealing and the abstinence from sexual misconduct. Uh, this is the right action. So uh, let me again come back to how this is defined in the suit in a bit more detail, because uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is quite nice the way these things are defined. And uh, so this is the idea of not killing. Yeah, it is specifically said, uh, you give up killing living beings. Uh, you renounce the rod and the sword. Uh, you are scrupulous and kind, living full of compassion for all living beings. Uh, so again, you can see that this is much more than just the mere giving up of killing, uh, the giving up of the, uh, the negative side of the thing. Uh, it is actually the cultivation of the opposite, the cultivation of compassion, of kindness, uh, of care for all the beings in the world, yeah? So you lay aside the rod and the sword. In other words, you lay rod here is related to the idea of punishment. You don't punish, uh, you don't uh, uh, kill, you don't, uh, uh, you're not harsh with other living beings. Instead, you are the exact opposite. Uh, you are compassionate to all living beings. Uh, and this is the, uh, the, kind of the more complete understanding of what this is about. Uh, yeah, it's important to remember the positive side of these things. So, and then you give up stealing. Yeah? Uh, you take 
only what is given her. Yeah, you uh, you desire only what is given. You, in other words, you don't even think about stealing. You only have the desire for things that are given to you or things that actually are yours. Uh, and you keep yourself clean by not stealing. Yeah, yeah this this is the idea of not stealing. In other words, you don't even occur to you. Even the thought of stealing doesn't occur to you. This is kind of the ideal here. It's a very kind of high ideal because I guess it, the, these thoughts can occur to people every now and again. But uh, uh, you, you understand the problem with stealing. So the, even the idea of this doesn't even occur to you. Uh, and then the last one, the sexual misconduct, basically just means that you don't have any sexual relations with people who are not suitable for that. Yeah? In other words, you use uh, sexuality in a way that is considerate and that is careful and that uh, uh, does not uh, uh, trample on the rights of others. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's fairly obvious what that means. It means that you stay with your partner and etc. In, in life and uh, you keep things very uh, simple in that way. And of course, the higher aspect here is to live completely with abstinence of all sexuality. And uh, that, of course, is what one would do if you keep the eight precepts, uh, or as a monastic, of course, uh, then the complete abstinence is what, uh, what comes instead. Uh, so, um, anyway, that's, I'm not going to keep on too much about these things because they are really just the uh, foundations. And then we have the same idea again. And, you make an effort to abandon wrong action and an effort to enter upon right action. This is your right effort. Mindfully, you abandon the wrong action. Mindfully, you enter upon and dwell in right action. This is your right mindfulness. Thus, these three qualities run and circle around right action. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Yeah, your right view is there at the back of your mind. You always remember the danger in acting wrongly. You can understand why this is problematic. And because that view is very strong, it informs your mindfulness. So as soon as you are heading in the wrong way, mindfulness kicks in and reminds you that this is wrong. And then you take the counter action, yeah, the right effort, to steer your activity in the right way. This is what this is all about. Uh, so almost exactly the same as we saw for uh, right speech. Yeah, right speech and right action uh, being very closely related to each other. Yeah. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, this is about right livelihood. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, therein because right view comes first. Uh, and how does it come first? You understand wrong livelihood as wrong and right livelihood as right. This is your right view. Yeah, so livelihood here is really just an extension of right action. So you want to have a livelihood that is compassionate, that is caring, not a livelihood that leads to the detriment for people and beings around you. What is wrong livelihood? And here you have this, uh, um, uh, quite an unusual way that this is described. It is described here as scheming, uh, talking, hinting, uh, belittling, pursuing gain with gain. This is wrong livelihood. So uh, the idea here is that you are kind of tricky. Yeah, uh, You are... Uh, not just talking, but uh, 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 lapana here can mean like um, uh, flattering people. Yeah, you are scheming and flattering them. You're giving hints. Uh, you're putting people down, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so you're using uh, basically bad conduct to acquire uh, a livelihood. Yeah, to make life better for yourself. Uh, you can see why that is problematic. Yeah, so you are you bring your morality very squarely into your livelihood as well, into your working life. And you prioritize the spiritual life over all the worldly kind of uh, sides of life. So uh, and I think this is one of those very important principles. And this is something that people often underestimate, uh, the power of making the spiritual life your priority. 
And very often you will hear that people make the worldly life the priority. And the spiritual life is like a sub-aspect of the worldly life. So you have a spiritual life, you do meditation practice, you act morally, but you do it not so much because the spiritual life is the most important thing to you, but you do it because you want your meditation to support your ordinary life. Yeah, you are. You meditate a bit so that you can become a better parent, a better child, a better employee, a better whatever it is, yeah, a better at, at gaming or whatever it is that you do in this world. And you, because more mindfulness tends to make us better. Yeah, if you are in the military, you become a better soldier if you have more mindfulness. And that is an abuse of the Buddhist principles. So the idea is to turn things around. And instead of using the spiritual path to support your ordinary life, you use your ordinary life to support the spiritual path. Yeah, when you have in your livelihood, you make your work, your job, but you do that in a way that is part of the spiritual path. You understand the significance of these things. You imbue your worldly life, your work with kindness, with care, with looking up after people, looking after your customers, your fellow employees, all, all the people that have a vested interest in that work. Yeah. The same thing with your family life, uh, the same thing with all of these things. Uh, yeah. You imbue them with Dhamma qualities. Why? Because you understand that the spiritual life is what really matters. Uh, this is what really, in the end, is going to give you real satisfaction and contentment. Uh, the world is always going to be problematic, uh, but the spiritual life is, in the end, going to be what supports you not just in this life, but also in future life. So you turn these things upside down. You put the spiritual life on top. And what you find is that this becomes also very useful in your meditation practice, because it means that when you meditate, you actually don't think so much about the worldly things, because it is the spiritual things that are most important to you. You get things in the right priority. So that's why your livelihood then becomes purified in this way, because you prioritize things in the right order. Then we have this uh, division again about to the twofold kind of livelihood, and I'll just uh, pass that by. It is not all that interesting here. And uh, it then says that uh, the right livelihood is the one where the noble disciple abandons the wrong livelihood and gains his livelihood by right livelihood. This is right livelihood. So not, not very instructive. Yeah, you just abandon the wrong livelihood and you gain the living by, by right livelihood. Uh, but I think the idea is that it's very broad. Yeah, it, it's up to us to make sure that we do this in the right way. The basic idea, again, is not to do things that affect other people or animals or whatever it is in a bad way. That is wrong livelihood. Uh, yeah, so very often, in, in, not very often, but in one place in the suttas, it means that you don't trade in animals, and you don't trade in meat. That usually means that you are a butcher, yeah, so you don't kill animals, uh, for example. Uh, you don't trade in things that are used to oppress, yeah, in poisons or in uh, weapons, for example. You're not a weapons dealer. Any of you are any of you weapon weapons dealers? If you are a weapons dealer, you have to give up that wrong livelihood straight away. Yeah. So if you are, I don't know how many weapon weapons dealers are listening to this Dhamma talk. I guess not that many. You probably wouldn't be interested in a Dhamma talk if you were a weapons dealer, right? So you probably not. But it's not just weapon dealers. It is also dealers in alcohol as well, which are which is kind of. Um, uh, more problematic, yeah? So uh, ideally, you shouldn't be selling alcohol to people by like working in a bar, for example, or anything like that. Uh, so it, sometimes the, uh, the bar here can be quite high. So it's not just being a weapon dealer is not so hard to give up, but uh, working in a bar might be more difficult for some people. Uh, anyway, this is the way it is uh, usually all described at least once in the suttas. Uh, and... Uh, then you have the standard passage again at the bottom here. Uh, you make an effort to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter upon right livelihood. Uh, this is your right effort. Uh, mindfully, you abandon wrong livelihood. Mindfully, you enter upon and dwell in right livelihood. Uh, this is your right mindfulness. Uh, 
Because these three qualities, they run a circle around right livelihood. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. So uh, there you are. That, those are the uh, aspects of morality on the Buddhist path. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to bring those out because they're not part of uh, Magic Manikaya too. And uh, so uh, anyway, so there's a lot of the work in life had to do with the kind of basic parts of the path. But now I want to have a look at a couple of uh, uh, suttas. Again, these are suttas that are more uh, of an inspiring kind. These are suttas that have to do, you know, that are uh, verses in a sense. And I have decided in my life that actually the verses are often very useful because the verses are inspirational, they are uplifting, they're not as dry as some of the prose things that we often see. So I have decided recently to bring in more verse in the way I teach the Dhamma, simply to make it a bit more uplifting. Yeah. So the first one here is a beautiful verse from the uh, Dhammapada. I would really recommend you to read the Dhammapada if you have a chance. There's a lot of beautiful things found in the Dhammapada, and then you can reflect on that and make that part of your practice if you wish. And this is uh, verse number 118. And it goes as follows. Uh, should a person do good? In other words, if a person does good, let them do it again and again. Let them find pleasure in it. For blissful is the accumulation of good. Yeah? So, um, uh, if you are going to be a good person, uh, then make sure that you are good again and again. Yeah, the uh, Pali for good here is punya. So in other words, if you are going to make merit, if you're going to do good deeds, make sure that you do it always. You never really stop doing it. Yeah, you carry on moment after moment, day after day, year in, year out, because you understand the significance of this. But what you will notice here, that what is very interesting about this little verse is that you should should find pleasure in the doing of good. Yeah, you should enjoy it. You should re rejoice in it. You should delight in the activity of doing good actions. Yeah, you should kind of understand the power of these things, both for yourself and also for the people around you. And then it becomes very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm, really well. I'm a good person. Hooray. Yeah, and then you do an act of kindness and goodness because you know it is the right thing to do. And when you find that delight, what happens here, when this, this is kind of the important point, uh, when you delight in uh, an activity, when you delight in doing good, uh, then what happens is that you are very, very mindful, yeah, because mindfulness and delight, they go together. And the more mindfulness and delight you have when you do good, it sows a very, very deep seed in your mind. Uh, yeah, it makes it very, it's a powerful impression in your mind. Uh, it is something that is uh, uh, settled in your mind. And because of that, it is very easy to remember in the future. Uh, the more mindful you are, the more you delight in the activity, the good activities that you do, the more easy they are to remember in the future. Uh, yeah? And this matters enormously because this is where the idea of Sila Nusanti and Chaga Nusanti come in. Uh, yeah? If you... Uh, if you make a seed, if you make a very powerful imprint of your mind, uh, and then you start to meditate, then you sit down just to relax, it comes back to you. Uh, and you feel good about yourself because you re remember those things very easily. Uh. So the more right view you have, uh, yeah, the more you understand the significance of these things, uh, uh, the more you will delight in that goodness. The more you delight in it, the more powerful your mindfulness is. Uh, and then you will re uh, recall it very easily in the future, and it becomes part and parcel of your meditation practice. Uh, and this is ultimately what will make the meditation possible. Yeah, because you, uh, when you have that uh, uh, happiness inside, the delight inside of you, uh, it means that you will 
have the clarity inside of you, have the mindfulness there. You will be able to watch the breath. You won't have any sloth and torpor. You won't have any tiredness. You won't have any restlessness. You won't be thinking about the world because you find so much pleasure in just watching the breath. That is where meditation really starts to happen. So find that ple pleasure within. And when you find that pleasure in doing good, then blissful is the accumulation of good. Yeah, because you are uh, accumulating all those good qualities within uh, and you carry that mind with you into the future, it leads to bliss in this life through your meditation practice uh, and also in the future lives. You bring those qualities with you and they lead to uh, a good, happy life in the future as well. Why is that? Well, because if you have a good mind in this life, which is happy and content, that mind is what you take with you when you die into a future existence. Uh, so that is just this little sutta yeah, from the Dhammapada number 118. I'll have a look at one more uh, short little sutta. Uh, this is uh, uh, another sutta from the uh, Devata Sanyutta. So this is uh, all about the uh, conversations between the Buddha and the, uh, the Devatas, the, the divine beings. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, and uh, uh, so this again is the very first collection of students in the Sanyutta Nikaya, the connected discourse, the discourses, uh, and this is number 33, it is called the Sadhu Sutta, the uh, good. And so a Devata, a divine being, comes down to the Buddha yeah, and speaks to the Buddha. This is what happens. Uh, then a Devata uttered this inspired utterance in the presence of the Buddha. Good is giving, dear sir. Even when there is little, giving is good. When done with confidence to giving is good. And the gift of a righteous gain is also good. Giving with discretion too is good. So this is the, uh, the basic verse. And uh, the idea here is, is that uh, this is an expression of how to give, yeah? And uh, there is always an art to giving a gift. Sometimes we give kind of very, we just give things without really thinking about it. Uh, but if you learn to give it in the right way, then uh, it is even powerful. Giving is always good, uh, but if you give it the right way, it is even more powerful. Uh, yeah, so the Devata, first of all, saying giving is good, uh, and then making the point that even if you give only a little bit, uh, it is still good. And very often in life, we cannot always give large things or give you know, significant things. Sometimes we have to be satisfied with giving small things. And I think one of the most important things in life is the continuity of giving. Always giving more, always taking the opportunity, even if it is only a small little thing that we do. You know, the Buddha sometimes says, even if you just give to the insects, yeah, giving to the insects of the world, that is already powerful uh, because your mind is leaning in the right direction, yeah, heading in the right way. Uh. So even small little gifts are actually very important. Uh. One, when done with faith, yeah, I maybe prefer the translation confidence here rather than faith. The Pali is a sadha, uh, it is good. Uh. So if you have confidence, for example, in the Buddhist teachings, uh, you have confidence in a certain teacher or in the Buddha and the Dhamma, and you give them the Buddhist cause, yeah, because of that confidence, it is powerful. It is powerful because when you have confidence, it is like the mind goes there very naturally. It becomes a very strong kind of giving when the mind goes in that direction uh, almost by itself. It is not something you have to force at all, yeah, and it's so much easier to rejoice, yeah, if you give from confidence, you want to give, it kind of comes naturally from your heart. It's much easier to rejoice and delight in the given if you do that. Wow, it is so nice to give to the Dhamma, give to the Buddhist organizations, maybe like the BGF or the Sangha or whatever it is, because you know these things are powerful, beautiful uh, organizations that do so much good in the world, lead to so much happiness for so many people and beings all the way around. When you give a righteous, you give a gift of righteous gain. And this is also 
interesting. What that means is that uh, if you have uh, if you have gained your money or your possessions, whatever it is, if you have gained that uh, in a righteous way, in other words, in a way which is honest, uh, yeah, which you have gained through through your own hard work, through doing a proper livelihood, uh, then if you give from that, uh, it is more powerful. Uh, but if you give, let's say that you are a thief, for example, or you have gained things in slightly dodgy ways by cheating people or something like that, then when you give a gift from things that you have cheated, yeah, then it is not as powerful. It doesn't really work in the same way. And the reason is because if you have gained things in a proper way, yeah, by working hard or whatever, you feel like you deserve it. You feel like you deserve this thing. It really feels like it is yours. I deserve this because I worked really hard for this. Because you feel like you deserve it. When you give it, it is like you really give it. You are really giving up something. But if you don't deserve it, it's not, if it is not a righteous or honest gain, then it is almost as if you're not really giving anything because it feels like it wasn't really yours in the first place. It is not an honest gain. Then we have uh, giving with discretion. Yeah, this means like giving intelligently, giving after reflection, giving where it is required, giving when it is required, giving to those who are really worthy of being given to. In other words, being wise about how you give. Vicheya, this is a, a read to Dhamma Vicha. So uh, in other words, it is you investigate and you examine what is going on. And then when you give, it is more powerful as a consequence. So, so this is just some idea on giving and how giving is done in the right way. But then uh, the Devata adds another verse. And this other verse is also very interesting. Yeah. And further, restraint towards living beings is also good. One who harms no living beings, who does no evil from fear of criticism, in that they praise the coward, not the brave. For the good do no evil out of fear. So it's a little bit hard to understand that verse because of the way the way it has been translated. But the idea here is that uh, you know even higher in some ways than giving uh, is if you have compassion towards living beings, you are restrained towards living beings, uh, you don't harm any living beings. Uh, because uh, this is a kind of powerful gift when you give the gift of fearlessness to the beings in the world. Uh, so this is like a higher way of, uh, uh, of using generosity, if you like, to keep the five precepts and your kind to living beings. Uh, the idea here is that you do no evil from fear of criticism. Sometimes we are swayed by others uh, uh, maybe that there are some bad people around us and they kind of, we want to please those bad people. And because we are fearful of being criticized by people who are not good, then we might do something bad because we want to follow what other bad people are saying. Yeah? And, uh, but uh, you don't want to be praised as a coward. Yeah? You want to be praised for your bravery. Yeah? Yeah, they praise the coward, those people who push you in the wrong direction, they praise you because you are acting cowardly. That doesn't really matter. If you want to be praised, it's for your bravery, for taking a stand, for having the integrity of always doing the right thing. That is how you want to be praised. For the good, they don't do bad things out of fear. The good don't do any evil out of fear. You should not allow fear of criticism, fear of other people's opinions to kind of drive you towards doing bad things. And yeah, this is what this is saying here. So um, then um, uh, the Devata, it goes to the Buddha. This is only actually an extract from a longer sutta. There's a large number of Devatas that say things. And this Devata says to the Buddha, which one, blessed one, has spoken well? Yeah, and, uh, and then the Buddha says, you have all spoken well in a certain way, but listen to me too. Yeah, this is one of the uh, things that you 
find to sometimes in the suttas the idea that there is many different ways of speaking well uh, there's many different ways of expressing the same ideas in a sense uh, and sometimes even contradictory things can actually be spoken well they are can often be useful yeah or often be correct even if they are contradictory there's different ways of expressing the truth uh, but of course the buddha has his own way yeah, the buddha always goes more profoundly than everyone else uh, so this is what the buddha has to say here Surely giving is praised in many ways, but the path of Dhamma surpasses giving. For in the past and even long ago, the good and the wise ones attained extinguishment, they attained Nibbana. So uh, giving is great, yeah? but uh, the Dhamma surpasses giving. Yeah? So the uh, uh, the idea here, you will notice that the, uh, the path of Dhamma, it doesn't say it is better than giving, it says it surpasses giving. In other words, giving is part of that path, but you want to go beyond that, you want to do more. Yeah? And we should never kind of despise the more early stages of path, these are also very important, uh, but important to remember that we want to go beyond those things. Yeah? And ideally, of course, what we want to go, what we want to uh, move towards is, in the end, it is Nibbana itself, extinguishment, uh, the giving up of all these uh, desires for the worldly things, uh, going towards what the Buddha calls the highest happiness in the world. Uh, that is ideally where we want to be heading. Uh, and uh, this is always the Buddha's point of view. Yeah, The Buddha always goes very high and you can see all the devatas here, the, the divine beings, uh, they think a little bit like human beings, ordinary human beings. They want to be happy in this world, they want to give, they want to do the right thing. Uh, but the Buddha always takes the higher viewpoint. Uh, and um, it is very hard to understand this higher viewpoint of the Buddha. It is diff difficult enough to give up this world and attain a state of samadhi. You know, the idea of giving up the world is actually very difficult to understand for most people. That is hard enough, but to understand the full of idea of Nibbana is actually very, very difficult. And the best way to do that is simply to think of it as happiness. Yeah, The idea of Nibbana being extinguished, of getting rid of all the defilements of the mind, what it really is about, it is an extinguishment of suffering, an extinguishment of problems, attainment of the highest happiness, the highest satisfaction, the highest contentment in the world, that is what uh, this idea of Nibbana really is about. Uh, so think about it in the right way. It becomes very attractive. Uh, think about it in the wrong way. And some people might think it is scary. Uh, but of course, it is not scary. It is uh, uh, what we should all ultimately be aiming for. Uh, so uh, there you are. That is a, a, just a little bit more about the uh, morality aspect of the path, the uh, first aspects uh, that have to do with uh, uh, the uh, more initial practices. Uh, yeah, and uh, I will stop there for now. After the meal uh, today, after lunch, I'm going to come back to the uh, Majjhimani Kaya number two, the Sambhasana Sutta of all the defilements, uh, and we're going to start with a look at some of the very profound parts of the. Uh, how to deal with the idea of non-self, how to, what is right thinking, what is right view, according to that Savasava Sutta. And uh, so we're going to delve into some more profound things in a way. So uh, I hope you will come back for that. I think it is, uh, if you're ready for this thing, I think you will find it quite interesting because uh, it is really the core of what the Dhamma is about. So here you are. I wish you all I hope you have a nice lunch and uh, enjoy a nice lunch and I will see you back again at 12.30 here.